let's go ahead and get started. Thanks for coming in on President's Day. Sorry we couldn't get the day off for you. Uh, first thing I wanted to do is talk about class six, which will be our on-camera exercises. And I wanted to see if we could assign roles for that. I know I haven't mentioned reminded you of that. I think I wrote it in the syllabus that we would try to do it today. Um, if we need to discuss it a little bit, we can. If we need some more time, we can talk about that. But essentially, there is a video conference scenario with, I think, five or so different roles. There's an option you can do a press conference at, I think, at least one scenario where you'll give a press conference, or you could be a reporter at a press conference. You could also explain this statistics graph over Skype. You could also practice an on-camera interview if you want to do some preparation for that and think about how you would give an on-camera interview and think about the topic, and there's a process for that. So uh, let me start we're seeing if you have any questions on that, and if we'll deal with those first, and then we'll see if we can assign roles so you can begin thinking about what you're going to do to prepare for this class six. So, any questions first off? Okay, so let's uh, let's look at. Has anyone had a chance to look through these roles yet? Yes, yes, yes. We raise your hand if you looked at the roles at all. Okay, I'll get one person. All right, uh, well, let me we'll see how this goes. Um, do you, should we try to assign rules now, or do you want to come back next week? This is what, week three? <coughs> yeah, so this is going to be in two weeks, right? On camera is going to be in two weeks. Let me check that. All right, so today is the 15th. Yeah, today is the 15th, class three, and the on-camera workshop will be class six, but that's only two weeks from today, February 29th. So let's try to go through these roles, see if I can assign someone, assign people to the roles. Uh, if that doesn't work, we can maybe come back at the end after you've had a chance to think about it, and we can do some adjustments next week if necessary. So, with that said, let me go through the roles. So, the first scenario is this video conference scenario. There are five different roles. There's a person who's going to play the VP of, I'm on page nine of the syllabus, who's going to play the VP of annuity processing, there's the head of annuity processing, there's the project manager, there's the annuity salesperson, and there's the IT person. So, do I have a volunteer to play the VP of annuity processing and sales? No, I know you haven't read the scenario, but you'll just you'll read the company background and then you'll prepare. And then during the exercise, you'll say more sales, or less IT problems, or something like that, and try to communicate to someone else who's in a different room over Skype. Well, we all watch from the comfort of this room. Okay, now. Fantastic. All right. Uh, head of annuity processing. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, project manager. That would be excellent. Uh, head of annuity sales. All right. Sorry, second. 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 Uh, IT person? Yes, Jerry. Fantastic. All right. Next scenario is this graph where you will explain the statistical graph. Is anyone familiar with this graph created by Charles Bernard, which depicts Napoleon's Russian campaign in 1812? It's actually a very important development in statistics where you see this graph of Napoleon's forces marching to Russia and then retreating from Russia, and you see the line getting smaller. And there's some interesting things about what that did for statistics. And there's also some very interesting things about the story of this invasion and how you can see this on the graph. So 
Has anyone permit, seen that graph before? Let's start with that. Is anyone excited about statistics or um, war stories? Yeah, this sounds sexy, but i Okay. Um, and you can do two. Why don't you do, who calls for your hand? So I see another hand. Okay. One, Levy, why don't you and Jenny, Jenny do that one? And it's, 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 well, if it ends up being too much work for you, Levy, we'll, we'll figure it out. Okay. The next is on camera interviews. So, this is a chance for you to practice an actual interview. You'll pick the topic, you'll make up some questions, I'll pair you with someone who's going to be the interviewer, and you'll just get a chance to seeing what you look like on camera, practicing some of the eye contact and other techniques that we go over in class. So, you will be responsible for picking a subject and presenting some questions, and then the interviewer may throw you a curveball or two. Be a fun, intense, intense experience. Anyone like to do, do an on camera interview? Free, excellent. All right, free is part one. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay, would anyone like to be the interviewer? This will be an easier job. Maybe if you're doing something else, you can also do the interviewer. Priya will provide you with, yeah. Priya will provide you with some questions. You'll familiarize yourself with that and maybe think of one little gem to, to kind of add to it and throw her off. Okay. The next is our, actually we only have one press conference scenario. This is where we will have one person play the chairman of BP after this big oil spill that happened in 2010. And there's a script you will read with the press conference. We're sorry, we just spilled all this oil, we care about the people, that kind of thing. And then we'll have some reporters ask you some questions, and you'll use the techniques to answer hostile questions during a press conference to respond to those, respond to those, and we'll have a system where you get to see yourself on camera and evaluate that. Is there a volunteer to be Carl Henrik Sandberg? Yes, Josh. Would anyone like to play an annoying reporter? Yes. yes. Okay, anyone else reporter? Right. Okay, does everyone have a role? Oh, what's your, what's your name, by the way? Yeah. What's that? Oh, you can be a reporter? Okay, good. And what's your name? Oh, win win. Okay, good, good. I can check in after class if there's anything you missed and whatnot. Okay. Reporter, wait a minute. So is it anyone else? Does anyone else have something? You need something. What do you? What do you want to do? You want to? Uh, you want to do an on-camera interview? You want to join the statistical graph team? What's that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what did I think of for this? Eric, you want to? On, you want to do an on-camera interview? Yes. Maybe a little more of an ambitious project, but you want to do it? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Okay, and when, when, can we have you interview Eric? <coughs> Skype, did any of the three of you use 
your Skype. You have an active, yeah, you have an active Skype account. Okay, can you bring, uh, you have your laptop, so that's your laptop, right? Okay, so on the day of the workshop, I'll have you go to a different room, log into Skype, and that's all good, right? Okay. And then Sagnik, Jerry, and Sagnik and Jerry, or Sagnik. Sagnik and Jerry. Do you two have Skype? Either of you have Skype? You have Skype? And you have a laptop? I have a laptop in my car. Oh, can you bring it to class two, two weeks from today? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, so you'll bring it to class and you'll log into your Skype account, and that's all good. And same question for Levy and John. You, so why don't you have Skype? Yes. Okay, you have Skype, so you will bring your laptop, log into Skype, fantastic. So all of these are done on the start? Yes, the, the first two, the, the video conference with the annuity processing people will be done over Skype, the statistical graph will be done over Skype, and the, inter the camera interviews will be done in here, and we may have a, something on the big screen similar to the press conference. I'm not exactly sure how we're going to do that, but we'll figure that out. Okay. And then so, Yang is in charge of Skype, and Sagnik is also in charge of Skype. Okay. Good. Fantastic. All right. So let's, then we, we will do, we have one other uh, logistical thing which we'll talk about with your technical presentations, which we'll do a couple of them next week. But I'm going to hold off on that logistical discussion until after we do the technical data discussion. So, with that, I'm going to start in with our technical data workshop. Alright, so this is a few hours in presenting technical data. Thinking about how you might present numbers, graphs, anything that might confuse your audience, some skills that we can use to make that more effective presentation. First, we'll talk about the definition what is technical data? Second, we'll revisit our objective and conclusion discussion because when you're presenting something complicated, the last thing you want to do is forget that you're trying to accomplish an objective, and the last thing you want to do is forget that you're using powerful conclusions to accomplish that. You don't want to get wrapped up in the numbers just because it gets a little more tough. Okay. We'll talk about some pointers on PowerPoint design. We'll also talk about this idea of what I call PowerPoint competition, which means the PowerPoint slide is competing for attention with you. So you're the speaker, you're trying to talk. The PowerPoint itself is demanding attention and you want to keep the focus on you, how you can avoid that confusion, that distraction. So, how you can make that work. We'll talk about transitions, going from one subject to another, nothing earth shattering, just some basics to keep your audience with you. Visual aids, graphs, pie charts, bar charts, how you can present those, how you can decide which ones to use. Jargon, definitions, technical terms that might confuse your audience, how to identify that in your presentation, and how to eliminate it. Go through a quick exercise. Content enhancements. Just a few things to spruce up your presentation. We could do this really at any point. It doesn't have to be technical data, but we'll include it at this point because it helps to have interesting things in your presentation when you're going through a lot of technical type stuff and because you're going to be doing a full presentation next week. So a few ideas to help you with that. Then we will talk about your technical presentation design and assignments. See if you have any questions on that. I'll let you know how that's going to work because there's a little kink with our snow day and how I did the scheduling. And then we will do our team graph presentations. I gave you some data and told you just to take a quick look at it with your teammates. I will give you another 15, 20 minutes to wrap things up after we do the discussion so you can think about incorporating some of the techniques we go over today and how you want to present that. And then we'll have each of the three groups come up and make a presentation. So, with that, we'll start off with the definition of technical data. And I'll just throw it out. The definition I want us to work with is anything that might confuse your audience. 
I'm going to ask you in a minute what sort of presentations you do, but I, I don't want to get confused on anything there. This could be numbers, statistical charts. This could be complicated definitions, complicated language. You tell me, what else could be a technical data type of presentation that you've either seen, heard of, something you do in your jobs, where you might be able to use some skills to make it clearer for your audience? Discussing IT terminology? Yeah, fantastic. Work with a lot of IT people. And if the more IT people can communicate effectively with the audience, the more the audience likes that IT person, the more unusual it is and the more valuable that IT person is. Someone who can talk in the IT language and communicate effectively with the lay audience, that person is golden. Anything else? Yes? Discussing best ideas? What? Investment. And investment ideas. So you're going to be talking to, I think you mentioned in your discussion or your presentation last week in your paper that you want to be able to bring your knowledge as a, an investment analyst to people who don't have time or knowledge. And if you do th say things that are going to confuse them while well, you're trying to get them to invest, are they going to say, oh, that person confused me. They must be really smart. I'll give her a bunch of money. <laughs> she knows stuff that I don't know because I got lost. Is that what they're going to say? No, they're going to say this. I don't have any idea what this person is talking about. It makes me feel like whatever. It makes me feel lost. I want to give. I want to give my money to somebody who has it simple. Who has a simple way of making me understand. Second, uh, research and development data. Yes. Yes. Great idea. Great point. Anything else? All right. So good. Those are some of the things we can use these types of skills for. And again. Those and anything else that your audience might not understand. So, objective. Remember we talked about when you're giving a presentation, you want to have a purpose, an objective. And the very last thing you want to do when you start talking about numbers is think that your objective is to just go over the numbers. We talked about we don't want to retreat to you explaining the numbers and you thinking that that's what's important. What you're trying to accomplish with your audience is still the most important thing. Any graphs, any statistical analysis, that stuff is just a tool to give your audience what they need. And again, we talked about how objective forces us to try, use these numbers, use this data to try to accomplish this objective. Watch your audience, monitor, make sure they're understanding. If they're not understanding, don't just keep firing numbers at them, adjust. Quick review, we just want to make sure we don't forget that. And the key thing we use to accomplish our objective, conclusions. We talked about conclusions being the important building blocks, conclusions being supported by premises. And when you're looking through your technical presentation, you can think about, is this a conclusion? Is this a premise? Or is this something that should not be in my presentation? Worst thing you want to do is go over something complicated that confuses your audience when there's really no purpose for your audience to know that or understand that. So again, conclusions, premises are the building blocks and the things we want to focus our content around. We have some ways of presenting conclusions verbally, non-verbally, which we went over in class one. And when you add them all up, and when you're talking about something that's confusing to your audience, it can make a huge difference. So I'm standing behind this lectern, going over some numbers, some data, some, some statistics, and then I use these conclusion presentation techniques. I pause. I come out from behind the lectern. I slow my rate of speech down. I click to the next slide that says the conclusion is how would that make you feel as an audience member? That I care about communicating this to you? That I'm not going to just run numbers at you? When you? Add all these little things up that can really help your audience understand, and really make your audience feel relaxed. Maybe they're worried about these concepts you're throwing at them, and they see you as the person guiding them through. All these techniques, which we went over in class one, very helpful added up. Uh, we went over the same thing with how you present premises, verbally, non-verbally. 
The one main thing with terms is we talked about this idea of a presentation motif, which could be as simple as listing premise one, premise two, premise three. It's a recurring physical or verbal action, which indicates parallel structure in your presentation and guides your audience through. And a number of you used a presentation motif effectively in your presentation last week. So, uh, those are the basics of the conclusion review. And remember we talked about this thing we call the attention, retention curve based on the beginning, middle, and end of your presentation. Who can sum that up for us? Tell us what's the takeaway of the audience's level of attention at the beginning, middle, and end. Yes? some confusing definition, some confusing graph, or are you going to say something that's clear, interesting, and effective? I'd say say something that is clear, interesting, and effective right when your audience is focused on it. Now, when you're going to treat them with that clear, possible, brief description of a conclusion, you get into the middle of your presentation, you still have a decision, am I going to further explain the conclusion first? Or am I going to start explaining the data that leads up to the conclusion and then give you the conclusion? Well, we have a little bit more of their attention at the beginning of our middle, so we might want to start with the conclusion first. So I've intrigued you in the beginning with something that's clear and understandable, and then I'm going to tell you the important conclusion and the takeaway and work from there. At the end, as Vanessa said, the audience perks up a little bit, realize your presentation is almost over, they think you're going to say something important, give them what they want. Say, reinforce that content, use that opportunity. Okay, any questions about our conclusion and objective review? We're going to move on to PowerPoint design. And we can talk about PowerPoint for several sessions. These are just a few of the highlights, the greatest impact tools that I've noticed in my presentation consulting. So I'm going to go over some of these basics with you. First thing, I suggest you use an engaging and undistracting template. Make the template interesting, but all the way up until a point where it doesn't distract your audience. I like a simple white myself. You may notice that this has a slight cloud color to it, so it's not just a blank white, but something that looks a little more professional, but doesn't distract you. And you don't have to use white like this. You can use something interesting, something that engages your audience, but ask yourself, is this so interesting that it actually distracts the audience? If the answer to that is yes, then make it a little more simple. I suggest using bullet points on your PowerPoint slide that are concise and incomplete. Why might I suggest that? Well, it doesn't have to focus on the speaker to fully understand what I said in the slide. Exactly. So you see this, and then your attention turns to me, because I need to fill in the rest for you. I'm not competing with the PowerPoint slide while you're reading some lengthy definition, and you're not confused by a lot of words, you're just guided by the PowerPoint. And then my job is to fill in the rest for you. I like a five by three rule for bullet points and text. I suggest a maximum of five bullet points, maximum of three words across. You don't always have to follow this rule, but I think it's a great rule of thumb. And if you find yourself using more than five bullet points, more than three words across, ask yourself, is this absolutely necessary? It may be. If it is, sometimes you have to do it. But I think that's the good rule of thumb to start with. 
parallel structure. I recommend parallel structure on bullet points such as these. You all are familiar with that. We talked about it with the written assignment, and I read uh, a few of those last night when I couldn't sleep, and then they put me right to sleep. <laughs> it's a joke, joke, joke. Um, what do you think? Are you all fans of parallel structure at this point? All right, and how is it going to help your audience if you use parallel structure on bullet points in your PowerPoint slide? Jen? Easier to read. Easier to read, easier to understand. You may be throwing so many different things at your audience, the last thing you want to do is confuse them with the curveball on the bullets themselves. Anything you can do, it's all going to add up. Customized slides. What I mean by customized slides, you may want to think of a footer such as Rutgers Business School, Business Communications, Spring 2016. Forms your audience where they are, what's going on in your presentation. Now this is a little different because we're in this whole class, but if you were just seeing me for a 20 minute or 30 minute presentation, and in the middle of that presentation you forget and you get confused, you always have some sort of little customized footer to ground you. Topic in top line. By top line, I mean this line, PowerPoint design. By now, you've heard me stress the conclusion being the important thing so many times. You might be tempted to think that I want the conclusion in the top line, but I don't. I want the topic in the top line. It's the way we're used to understanding and processing this information. So I click to this slide. You see the nice customized header footer, or nice customized footer. You know how this slide relates to you. You see the topic in the top line. You know what's coming next. Important things that relate to that topic underneath. It's just what we've gotten used to, and it works effectively when we present. And like I mentioned, You've heard me say conclusion being important so many times that I have had people I've worked with, they'll put a conclusion right in the top line, and it gets a little jarring. As an audience member, you're like all of a sudden, whoa, whoa, you must uh, do this or that. I recommend you start with the topic to ground your audience. Yes? I think in uh, regards to that, I mean, I had people who had told me um, when I was working for a company, and they told me that they want to see Without having to read the whole slide, they want to actually see what's in the slide in just one sentence up at the top. Okay. Um, is that is that sort of the norm, or in, in let's say in, in the business world? We, so they want to see what's in the slide. Do they want the conclusion in the slide? Yeah. So they told me that without having to go through this entire content, you know, they want to maybe they don't have a whole lot of time to spend reading the, the, the headline. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so absolutely, if those are your instructions, then you want to pick, put the conclusion in the, in the front line. I, I mean, I, I want to open up this discussion to you all, and we can discuss this when we see some examples of your presentations. But I think it works better this way. I think it gives your minute, your audience, a minute to mentally categorize what's going on. So you're going to tell me some things about PowerPoint design. Maybe we're saying investment opportunities. Maybe you might have investment opportunities here, or investment decision here, and you know that what's going to be in the slide is a yes or no on the investment decision. Maybe that would guide your audience very quickly to the takeaway. Yes? Yeah, I sort of, uh, I'm, I'm trying to say the same thing, sort of like Priya ended up hearing many times I've heard from my previous mentors, make it a syllable. Just don't write something like like it should be like when you're in an international conference, the slide topic should attract people to come to you. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I would not disagree with that. And not have generic titles like PowerPoint design. Okay. Can, can you give me some examples? Maybe we'll discuss them. Um. Let's say if. Yang is trying to invest, uh, having an investment slide yes. about a, about one portfolio. She writes, this uh, this portfolio is generating 20% return in one year. So 20% return of this portfolio in one year. 
Okay. Okay. Rather than having the twenty percent down. Okay, so instead of saying portfolio returns in the top line, yeah. saying portfolio returns 20%. 20%. Okay, so that's something you need to weigh, and the factors you need to consider are one, if your company tells you, we want the conclusion, or your manager tells you, we want the conclusion in your top line, obviously you want to do that. Yeah. If you're working with very well-informed investors who want it right up in front, that's another reason why you might want to put it in the beginning. Yeah, I heard it from uh, R and D people, like you know, when going to technical conferences and new technology and whatnot. Yeah, especially if you're going to a conference where you're going to be with like professionals who want that information fast, that is another thing you you would want to consider. Uh, if this so-called conclusion is either going to surprise or scare your audience, then you might want to shy away from yeah. that, and you might want to just present the topic. They're good points. These rules are not written in stone. These are my general recommendations. Uh, okay, great. Let's look at a couple examples of PowerPoint slides and let's critique them based on these ideas and any other thoughts you have. So let's look at this first one. Take a look at that slide. Tell me how it could be more effective or if it's already really effective. Why? Second. Yeah, I think that the background attracts me more than what the content is. I think you don't have uh, three words, you have too many words, so I'm trying to figure out what actually you're trying to come up with and I might lose attention to what the speaker is saying this way. Okay, so background is good, right? You like the picture? Yeah. That can work. Uh, too many words hard to read all of this. And you might try to read it while the speaker is trying to tell you something important. And what was the other thing you said? I thought the background is not good. Oh, not good? Yeah, oh, okay. it's so distracting. Distracting. Okay, okay, good. Other thoughts? The uh, color of the text um, is too light on the right side. It's okay, I'll have to have down. Yeah, so, so we're losing it here. Now maybe, if this person had shorter bullet points that didn't bleed over to this side, we may say, oh, I like having this picture, and I'm able to follow the shorter bullet points. That might be something. Anything else? Yeah? I'm confused with the title. I don't know what this title is really trying to tell. Yes, OK. So it's a little out of context, so it's especially abrupt when you're seeing it. So, this slide might benefit from a customized footer to tell us what's going on in this slide. I will tell you, this is a slide from a former student who was doing a resume PowerPoint presentation. He was presenting his resume as a PowerPoint. So if you knew that, you would, you would have more information, but um, we can see it out of context and, and think it needs it even more. So this was a job. This person worked at the Department of Buildings Development Hub as the lead technical intern, and these are the duties that this person had. Josh, did you have I was going to say that there was no uh, parallel structure, which is jarring. Yeah, jarring. Okay. Josh uses the term jarring. Parallel structure is not, is very jarring. Lack of parallel structure is jarring. So let's talk about the parallel structure here. What's, what's going on with violations of parallel structure? Third point is respond, it should be responded. Yes, okay, so we've got perform, manage, assisted, and respond. So this is in present tense, this is in this, the rest are in past tense. Anything else? Love you. Oh, well, you have verbs and nouns. Where, tell me. Well, you need technical intern, and then other ones are like stuff that is done. Okay, so this, yeah, exactly. So this is a noun. And the, 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 the rest are verbs. So lead technical intern is a noun. It's a thing. And the rest of these are verbs doing things. Is that is that an issue? Is that, is that? that is that is an issue, and that's that's interesting. And how would you fix it? Let's say you want to say you were the lead technical intern. How would you? Yeah. Put and, that in there? And, and what I what I say about this slide is there's another violation of parallel structure that this is the title, and these are the duties. So it's doubly confusing that way. Not only is one, there's 
one series of verbs and the other is a noun, but this is the title and these are the duties. So you would want to structure it differently so it's visually obvious to your audience. Just like you do on a resume. You don't put the title, the job title, in the same visual format as you put the duties, right? So you would structure that differently and you would change this response to responded. And of course you would, you would cut it down to like three words. Other comments on that? Priya. Actually, I mean, sometimes it's unavoidable that you can't really have it like three words or five words. Um, and I have done that in my presentation sometimes that I would actually color, um, code the words that I want my audience to focus on. Um, either make it bold or get the color and sort of audience knows that I want them to focus on those. Would that be an okay technique or yeah. what would you? I think that's a good technique. Okay. Another technique that I'll, I'll recommend is use the um, use this entrance effect. So you might have parallel structure here and then you, your next click will be a longer paragraph explaining parallel structure because you feel so, for some reason you need to include right. that. So while you're talking, you just have this, and then when you're ready for the longer definition or ready to move on to the slide, you animate it in a way. That you animate it in. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, it hasn't been brought up, but I just want to talk about animation. You know, they have all these fancy ways to bring in the next slide. I personally think that's very unprofessional. Like a bouncy uh, yeah. slide yeah, or something like that. that. Or a sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Does anybody have any sound? <laughs> I have seen that. Yeah. Uh, and depending on <coughs> the context of the presentation, sometimes it can work. Most of the time, I would recommend a more conservative entrance effect. Levy, how do you like what, what I've done here? Just the, I think this is a white. And it's just, do you like, do you like, do you like what I've done, or do you think this is too unprofessional? It's okay. You can no, go to the next one. It's, it's, it is conservative. Oh, it's this. Not, oh, the sideways one. That's what you talking about. That's what, that's what you were just talking about. Oh, well, I was asking. Do you think these right here? No, those are good. These are fine. Yeah, those are fine. Um, these are fine, but too much. Even the white from the side. Well, I think like, like if I'm listening to a presentation, this is me. It's because I'm. I don't know. I've got ADD or something. But I'll read it. I'll read the stuff, and then I just won't listen anymore. Yeah. So. That kind of went Sorry, but let me stop you there. So he's reading the stuff that is not listening to you. That is not what we wanted to present. Yeah, no, correct. So tell us how so, to fix that. Well, if you do it the way you do it, where you say, like, you're not putting up the whole slide, so you're only putting up the point as, you say, as you're saying it or after you said it, then I'm listening to you, and then I could always kind of just go back and look just to kind of recall the points that you've mentioned. Yeah, so short, concise bullet points that guide the audience when they need to check in and see where you are most of the time, Levy's going to be looking at you. All right, great. Let's look at another example, see if we like this PowerPoint slide, see if we don't like it. Boom. Take a look. Tell me if you like the way that's laid out and the way that it is brought in. The rest is up to me to explain. The rest of the time, the focus is on me. 
So perhaps you can bring them in one at a time. This might be okay, bringing them all four of them in at, the time, at the same time. No? I feel the layout is kind of like having the up on the top of the side, and then it just all black on the right side. I don't know if there's a way you can. What, you don't like this white space? Yeah, it's too much white in Oh, what well, do you want, maybe a little center? I just feel the layout of the paper looks so unbalanced. Oh, that's a good point. Anyone else feel that way? I don't feel like it's playing stand back here. Yeah, I, I feel the same too. It's, it's as if I'm expecting something else to show up. Ah, that's a good point. Okay, so I, I that's a perfectly valid <coughs> point. Maybe you would want to move these a little bit to the center. Maybe it's just a context thing as well. If you do all your slides like this. And as you get to this point in your presentation, your audience knows that, oh, you're just going to have these four things. But, you know, definitely consider that. Natalie? What do you say about pictures? I like pictures. Yeah. Pictures are good to entertain and inform your audience, just as long as they're not too busy and not too distracting. I don't want the font. Okay, the font. What do you tell me about? What do you want? Um, I don't know. It doesn't seem like the font is a good fit for the topic of discussion. Uh, maybe a, something a little more professional, given we're talking yeah. about credit and yeah. whatnot. Yeah. It looks sort of cartoonish. Yeah. All right, that's fair. Frank. The thing is, it is better to add some motions. Uh, for example, the last three fonts are <coughs> come out after you finish the first font experience. Uh, you want, you want these in one at a time? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's fair. And then Zhenning and I were talking about that being uh, a possible option. That it could work this way. It could also be better one at a time, Josh. Um, I guess the whole thing is just a little too minimalist for me. Um, you know, the all white background with just such sparse text. I think that's what they were uh, you know, alluded to before. Is that, I mean, it's a little unbalanced visually, but the whole thing might be better Okay. Yeah, you're right. And, 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 and in fairness, I, I get this comment a lot. And honestly, the reason I put this slide up is an example of a good, clear presentation. So I'm going to have to rethink this because I do get this being, well, it's just, I need more. It's too minimalist. So, so thanks, thanks for the feedback there. Um, and these are all great points. But I would like to point out that there are definitely redeeming qualities in this slide in that it doesn't use your audience, gives your audience a guidepost, if you will, and allows them to focus on you. Even though, to, to your points, it could be improved. Okay, avoid PowerPoint competition. So, we talked about this idea of your audience reading the PowerPoint when you want them to be listening to you. How are we going to avoid that competition? We're going to talk to the audience. We are not going to turn and look at the slides spend our whole time facing the slides, looking at the slides. It just looks weird when someone's back is to you. It also looks like they're giving their power to the slide. I've heard the analogy, it looks like you're, you're bowing down to the slide. By staring at it the whole time, you're telling the audience, this is what you need to look at. This is the important thing. Not me, the person who's worked in this industry for 20 years and spent the last two months on this project. Don't listen to me, just read the slide. Talk to the audience, face the audience. They want to hear from you as the expert. The also, I find people who look at slides give them the impression that they actually don't know, like they, they don't know the stuff, they actually just read off the slides, they, they're not familiar with the topic and have to just say it offhand. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and I, could, I mean, I see this with a lot of professors um, in some classes. Okay, fair enough. So, you want, you want someone. You want to listen to someone who is an expert in their field, and they should be able to talk to you from memory for a good portion of this presentation. They may refer back to the slide just to see where they are and be reminded, but if they do something like, okay, let's see, how can we avoid PowerPoint competition? Well, let's get some ideas. Oh, turn touch talk. That's something we can use. Let me see what that is. Read the definition. That's going to hurt your credibility, as Levy, as Levy pointed out. So talk to the audience. A technique you can use to talk to the audience 
is a technique called turn, correction, touch, turn, talk. It was developed by 3M. Let me explain how this concept works. This concept involves doing these three things, and by touch means click the pointer, or click the slide thing for the next bullet or the next slide. So that's the touch. Turn means turn and look at the slide, and turn back. And talk means talk to your audience. So three things, touch to the next slide, turn and look at the slide, look back to your audience, and talk. The key for this concept is you do all those three things one at a time. You do not do any two of them together. You do not touch, turn, and talk as you are, you, know, you, don't, you, know, you don't touch, turn, and talk at the same time. Sometimes I'll point out this as method when I notice a presenter, their head going back and forth like 20 times during the presentation, or if you have a tendency to talk as you're looking at your slide and talk as you're turning back. And if that gets confusing, I'll say, let's use the touch, turn, talk method developed by 3M to make sure that you're only doing one thing at a time. Why is the heading of the title avoid PowerPoint competition? OK, so the idea is we don't want to compete with PowerPoint. We don't want PowerPoint competing for the audience's attention okay. with us. All right. I want PowerPoint to be helping me, not competing with me. I don't want you distracted and trying to read the PowerPoint when you should be listening to me. Another technique we can use, blank screen. So what are you going to do now? Do I have any competition from PowerPoint right now? No, because there's a blank screen. Maybe I have an important conclusion I want to emphasize at this point. Maybe I want to explain my expertise in a certain area. For whatever reason, I want you to focus on me. It's a very powerful technique. Most clickers will have a blank screen option. Stand to the left. So this is a little hard because we've got this lectern here. The idea is that I suggest you stand to the left of the PowerPoint. Why would I suggest you stand to the left to make it easier on your audience and to avoid this PowerPoint competition? Yeah, so you start with me because we read left to right, and then as your eye gets to the end of the sentence, you'll automatically come back to me, because that's the way you read. You just read left to right, left to right, left to right. Just one of those little things that makes it a little bit easier on your audience and puts you in more of a powerful position to translate what's on the slide. I like to recommend often that folks use that zip zap zoom technique we did last time. So it's almost like I have some sort of ball of energy, and I'm going to zip zap it to the audience. And I'm in this power position to the left of the screen, physically engaged. My audience can read what's on the slide, but their focus will naturally be drawn back to me. Josh? Uh, I, just, I guess I have a question about if you're presenting with multiple people or you know, two or more people, do you recommend that everyone's to the left and or alternating sides, or is there, should you just like, swap positions as you go through? All right, good point. Uh, it depends. First thing I'll say is this is not a hard and fast rule. For one thing, I mentioned we have this desk, so I don't stand to the left of this lectern. So I often stand here. We do the best we can. Maybe if you're having two people present and they're interchanging their speech, I'd probably recommend one on either side. That tends to be the most comfortable for the audience. If for some reason you have some materials over here, you might have two on one side. That could look a little awkward, but if there's a reason why they need to work with the audiovisuals or show samples or something. Yeah. What else we got? We have several people just waiting to talk. You, know, you might have three people in a line. You do your best not to make that look awkward. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know. I'm sure other people also, but I 
I'm giving presentations at business school where there's like seven of us on a team and the professor wants to hear from everyone. And so you know, it's like there'll be two people on that side, there'll be four of us on that side, and everyone's just kind of like waiting their turn. And then it's like, oh, it's, it's, it's my side, let me just kind of slide by everyone to get towards the screen. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, well, what's your thought on it? Does that get confusing? What's the best way to handle that? Um, I mean, I, I think the best, or what I, what's worked out the best is when everyone knows very clearly what the order is, and you know, to the best of our ability, everyone's standing in that order uh, mm -hmm. already, um, so that even if you do have to switch, it's kind of just one person moves to the end, and then and it's set up. Yes, and it makes it easier on the audience, too. They just say, all right, this person, this person, this person, rather than this person talks, this person, oh, this person, and then this person who say, I didn't see you, or standing behind the other guy. That might be confusing. Another thing to keep in mind or technique that works is have everyone who is not presenting staring at the person who is presenting. So it's not like you have these seven people facing the audience who's going to speak next. It's if you're not speaking, you're intently looking at the person waiting for your turn to contribute. Okay, stand to the left and some other stuff. Entrance effects. This is what we talked about with the animation effects. Click in one at a time. So if I have everything on the slide and I'm trying to talk to you about entrance effects, what are you looking at right now that might be competing with my desire to tell you about entrance effects? The PowerPoint, but is there something specifically you're looking at that you're wondering? Oh, I wonder what that is. Maybe not. Well, how about this last one? Overture the slide. So I have to put all of the bullet points there, but I'm trying to get you to concentrate on entrance effects. Maybe you're looking at this last one saying, I wonder what that is. Oh, when's it going to start talking about that overture? Is this a musical thing? What's going on here? So I recommend bringing things in one at a time very powerful way to keep your audience with you. Now, if you cannot do entrance effects, if you have to bring in everything at once, maybe you're bringing in a graph, maybe for whatever reason, entrance effects aren't practical, I like a technique I call overture the slide. Now, if you are a musician, you know overture means a sh uh, the beginning of a musical. It's just a short little blurb of all the musical numbers all the things in this play, opera, whatever. So it's just a short little introduction of everything that you're going to do. And then you get into the meat of it and you do all of those things. So I recommend using this technique by explaining everything that's on the slide and then zeroing in on where you want your audience to focus. So if I'm using the overture the slide technique on this slide, I might say, let's talk about how you can avoid PowerPoint competition. We're going to first talk about the idea of, touch, of talking to the audience. I'm going to go over a 3M technique. I'm going to tell you about a blank screen, a concept about standing to the left. Then we'll talk about entrance effects. And finally, I'm going to talk about this technique of overturing the slot. Now, let's go back to the first one. Talk to the audience. Let me explain that. Now let's move on to the second one. Press turn talk. So I have satisfied your curiosity of what is on the entirety of this slide, therefore you are less likely to try to read it while I'm trying to get you to focus here. Any questions? Make sense? Okay, let's look at a couple PowerPoint examples. Same thing, try to think about what we like, what we don't like. So this is another example from the Small Business Administration. I'm going to talk to you about eligible project costs for this project. I've got a bunch of things. I've got real estate, machinery, equipment, soft costs, refinancing. I've got all this information up, and I just throw it at you all at once. Let me suggest instead I might use an entrance effect. I might say, boom, here are the project eligible costs. First, I'm going to talk about real estate. And we're going to talk about how existing buildings and renovation factors into that. Now let's talk about machinery and equipment. Yada, yada, yada. Now let's talk about soft costs. Now let's talk about a refinance. So do we like that better than throwing, at you, throwing it at you all at once? 
Yeah, I think it's an improvement. But still, I'm bringing in these blocks all together. What if I were to break it down and bring it in one line at a time? What if I were to say real estate? Okay, now under real estate, we have existing buildings, blah, 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 blah. And we also have renovation stuff, blah, 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 blah. Now let's talk about machinery and equipment. Minimum 10 year life, there's some details you need to know with that. And you also need to know about the manufacturing equipment. How do you like that? What if I were to bring them in one at a time? Would you like that more than bringing them in as chunks? Yes. Yes? Okay, so I think it's a little improvement. Let me take it one step further. Suppose I were to do it like this. Let's talk about the project eligible costs. The different cost categories are as follows. We've got real estate, machinery and equipment, soft costs, and we've got refinancing. Those are the four broad categories. Now let's focus in on real estate for right now. Let me tell you about existing buildings. Let me tell you about motivation or renovations. Okay, we've talked about that. Now let's talk about machinery and equipment. Ten-year life, manufacturing equipment. Same thing with soft costs. Same thing with refinance. How do you like that? Money Yeah, yeah, I like that. So it gives us the overview of the four things. Guides our audience. Doesn't give them a bunch of confusing text until you've had a chance to explain and then address it. Okay, let's move on to transitions. Now, this is nothing complicated. This is transitioning from point A to point B. First, I was talking about marketing. Now, I'm going to talk about the financing aspect. Now, I'm talking about the financing aspect. Now, I'm going to talk about the operations. Just going from point one to point two can be confusing if you don't guide your audience the right way. Especially if you're up here, if you're nervous, you're just firing through data, and your audience doesn't realize where you are. So some very simple techniques to say, let's move on to the next point. Let's think about how point A is related to point B. Let me hint at point B before I even get to point A. I've got a technique for transitions I recommend called the triple L strategy. In order of effectiveness, I recommend you lead into transitions, link items as you transition, and label transitions. Let me explain this in more detail. So this strategy, in order of effectiveness or preference, leading is the best thing to do, linking is the second best thing to do, labeling is the minimal thing you must do. Let me give you some examples. So labeling is just saying you're making a transition. So that was our little blurb on finance. Now let's talk about the marketing aspect. I just labeled that I'm moving on to something else. Simple, but very important. Have any of you ever heard a presentation where the speaker doesn't label a transition? And all of a sudden you're like, whoa, marketing finance. I'm lost. I was lost already. Now I'm even more lost. You must label your transitions. What's even better is if you can link point A to point B. So that was the finance aspect. And we're going to make a lot of money in this investment opportunity. But the question is, how are we going to advertise this? How are we going to tell everyone that the finance aspect is so strong? All right, well, that's where marketing comes in. So let's talk about marketing. So we've linked point A, point B. And what's even better, I think, is if you can lead into the next subject by hinting at it, without even saying it. Get your audience interested in what's coming next before you tell them what's next. So here we're talking about finance. This is a great investment opportunity, right? You all like the finance aspect. So what do we need to do next? Do we just sit on this finance opportunity? No, no, we've got to tell people about it. We've got to market it. Good point. Good point, Vanessa. I'm glad you brought up that marketing aspect. So let's move on to the marketing aspect. Let me lead into it by hinting at it as I finish up the first time. Any questions on that? Do you like the triple L strategy? Very least, label your 